Thank you for listening to this episode of History Exchange. Danke, dass Sie wieder dabei sind bei dieser Episode von History Exchange. Further information can be found on Center Austria's homepage www.centeraustria.org und auf der Homepage des Instituts für Zeitgeschichte der Universität Innsbruck www.uibk.ac.at/zeitgeschichte. Hi, my name is Shelby Tibbetto. And my name is Anna Scott. We are currently in the fourth floor study room in the Earl K. Long Library on the campus of the University of New Orleans. Today's date is October 18th, 2023. We are interviewing with Jana K. Lippmann. Dr. Jana K. Lippmann is a historian of 20th century U.S. foreign relations, U.S. immigration, refugee studies, labor, and migration history. Her research interests follows U.S. diplomatic relations and expands internationally, including Cuba, Vietnam, and Hong Kong, with a concentration on the effects of diplomatic politics on the local population. Her educational background includes a master's and doctorate degree from Yale. She is currently a professor at Tulane University in New Orleans. Dr. Lippmann, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. So nice to have you. As you know, we are creating oral interviews to contribute to a very special web fest shrift to honor Dr. Gunter Bischoff for his life and work. Um, we are working in conjunction with the University of Innsbruck, with whom he has a close relationship over the past few years. Um, we are very honored that you've agreed to join us and contribute because we know you've had a really long and fruitful relationship. So thank you very much. Um, the first part of your interview now will be to discuss your relationship with Dr. Bischoff. So let me start by just asking, how did you first meet? Yeah, no, I um, thank you, first of all, for doing this. I'm so happy to celebrate um, Gunter's career and scholarship and academic life. Um, and I met Gunter because when I came to New Orleans, it was in 2008, I was a very junior professor, and it was 15 years ago, And I had a senior colleague, my good friend and colleague, Larry Powell, and he said, there's someone at UNO I want you to meet. There's this um, another diplomatic historian. Um, I told him that we just hired a diplomatic historian, and he was interested in meeting you. So I wasn't really sure what to expect, and um, I don't remember if I emailed him or if he emailed me, but we agreed to have lunch together. And it was just great because I was new to the city and I was still meeting people and making new connections and I didn't have any connections here at UNO. And I think Gunter was really happy to have another diplomatic historian. We both belong to this organization called Schaefer, which is the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. And we talked shop and we went out for lunch and what were the new books he was reading, what were the new books I was reading, what we thought about what was going on with diplomatic history. And we just had a great time. And it was very inside baseball. I know it's an American metaphor, but you know, it was very, you know, we were, we were sort of like, which was the best new book or who was where, you know, in the scholarship. And that really started off what became a tradition for us where we would meet once a semester. We would almost always go to Dosen Noodles on Carrollton Avenue for pho and spring rolls. Okay. And we would talk about what we were reading in diplomatic history. And it was just great to have a colleague um, so close by. You've done quite a few of the Schaefer conferences, haven't you, together, we noticed. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, we, we're, I mean, Gunter has been in Schaefer longer than me, um, but we both, that's really our intellectual home in many ways. So um, Gunter's work on, you know, Austria and the Cold War um, is quite different from my work on diplomatic history from, you know, looking at U.S. military base in Guantanamo or, um, or Vietnam, but we both really see diplomatic history as our intellectual focus. And so, you know, when you're a professor at a university, they usually have one person who is an expert in that idea, right? The idea is you don't want to have 10 people who do the same thing in the same department, which often means we're very isolated, right? So the p other people who do diplomatic history, there's one at every university maybe, but not another one at Tulane. And so to have Gunter here at UNO was just great because we could have each other um, because we were in the same city. What kind of relationship, I mean, what kind of effect, sorry, do you think that he had on your work as a historian, your development? 
So that's um, a really good question. I mean, so I think there's several things. So first of all, um, I really felt he was he was both a good friend and a mentor, right? Like he was very, he was someone I always wanted to talk about where the field was, what was going on. Um, we were both interested in issues of migration and refugees. Um, Gunter worked on a project several years ago on Austrian migration. Um, again, it's not as if it's um, if there's like a Venn diagram, right? Like the overlap is not huge, but we were both interested in questions of migration. And so he was looking at Austrian migration to the United States. I'm looking at Vietnamese migration. And this was really just exciting to have someone I could speak to about questions of migration, refugee politics in the Cold War. Um, and then Gunter was just wonderful because I, we might get to this afterwards as well, but I was a Fulbright in Austria, and I really think that Gunter inspired me to want to learn more about Austria, um, to travel there, to be able to teach there. So in all of these different ways, Gunter was a real um, inspiration and good friend. What is he like to work with? What's his character like? Oh, that you're asking, you know, is tough that, questions. No, yes. it's not tough questions. No. Gunter's fine. I mean, Gunter's great. So the thing that we worked on the most... This is, maybe this is not the best of the progress, but it might be, which is that we worked on this project to bring Schaefer to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And we both had this vision that Schaefer was going to come here. And we worked together really well. Um, I don't know if you have joint projects, but there's always a list of things to do. And you never know if your partner is going to do the things on their list until you start working with them. And Gunter did all the things on his list. I did all of the things on my list. Uh, we got all of the partners lined up. We were working with Schaefer. And the conference was scheduled for June 2020. Mm. And so, as a result, the conference did not happen. And we really had done a lot of work together. And it, it really was a, it was a very easy professional relationship. We were really excited about jointly hosting Schaefer here in New Orleans. Um, and then the pandemic happened. Mm. And everything, you know... As we all know, none of the all the conferences were canceled. I remember sitting there like in March 2020, being like, "No, like by June, I'm sure we're going to be in person." And of course, we weren't. Um, and then, really, the the piece that's so unfortunate is they did come to New Orleans in 2022, and Gunter and I were both in Austria. Oh no! So, oh, wow. So I was not. So we were not able to actually celebrate having Schaefer in New Orleans, despite the fact that we both did significant work on it. Do you see him still? I mean, do you see him regularly? Is he I still mean, trying to keep in touch? Oh, no, no, we're still good friends. I would say, though, I mean, I was away last... I saw him last spring. So we went out, so it, I have not seen him in the last few weeks or three months, but Gunter and I, um, we went out for a very nice dinner, uh, or lunch, sorry, we went out for a nice lunch to celebrate uh, his retirement. I am also um, really enjoy his wife, Melanie, and the three of us went out, um, and if I could be there next week, I would as well. Now, I anticipate and hope to continue seeing Gunter for many, many more years, um, even no, even though he is retiring and going to have more options and time and flexibility and places to travel. Um, but no, Gunter's a very good friend. Lovely. Melanie was actually one of the yeah. first interviews we listened to. Mm -hmm. um, so she, she's done a lovely, a lovely yes. talk on that. Yeah, Thank Melanie's you so great. much. Yeah. So now we're just going to talk to your personal career sure. as a historian. So can you just first tell us about your life before? Um, becoming a historian. Before becoming a historian, <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, so, I so the shorter story is, um, I mean, I, I think it really begins with um, when I was an undergraduate. I studied abroad, and I studied abroad in Vietnam, and that was a really life changing experience for me. And this was in 1994, so it was only 20 years after the U.S. war in Vietnam had ended. I was extremely young. I was 19 years old. I'd really never traveled by myself before outside the country. And it was just a radically different place. And that really excited and motivated me to ask questions about the U.S. military and U.S. imperialism that I had never even crossed my mind before. And so that, so that happened when I was in college. And after college, I joined the Peace Corps. So again, I had an international experience. This time I went to the Caribbean. I was in St. Lucia, which is an English-speaking island in the West Indies. And I was a teacher in a sort of high school-aged school setting. And 
I just, again, was really interested. It piqued my curiosity. I'm, to be honest, I was very naive. I never really thought about histories of colonialism or empire. Um, even though I grew up in the United States, I don't think I thought as deeply as one should about the long histories of enslavement in the Americas. And all of a sudden, here I was in this small Caribbean island where the histories of both enslavement and colonialism were palpable in a way that I had to confront it um, in a daily way for the first time. And so I came back to the U.S. at the end of two years. I did not think about graduate school. I worked um, in reproductive rights for two years. And I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. And I decided I didn't want to go into public health, even though I was working in women's health. And I decided that I wanted to go and study history. And what they don't tell you, maybe they do about history PhD programs, that um, hopefully and usually they are funded. And if you drop out after two or three years, no one asks for the money back. And so I decided that this was the better way of going rather than um, going into a professional degree that I would have to pay for. And so that is how I ended up in a history PhD program. <laughs> Brilliant. So was it all the different... Um, countries you travel to that kind of grew your interest into your specific topics you research now or what is the story of how you found so a little the specific bit embarrassing, topics? I think the answer is yes which is um and why the reason why I think it's embarrassing is that in the end as I think about my own career I'm like oh my goodness I've just studied the things that, like in my life you know there's a very sort of self-centered way of thinking about research questions um but in some ways the answer I think is yes my first book's on Cuba and the history of the naval base in Guantanamo Bay. And that clearly is coming out of my interest in Caribbean history. And then my second book is about refugee camps at the end of the Vietnam War. And the origins for that, I think very straightforwardly, um, is my experience as a young person living in Vietnam. Um, but the questions that I ask, I think, um, are not so much about my own personal biography, but that they're questions about how does the United States and Americans, or Americans and I am a U.S. citizen, what, do we, what are places we think of as peripheral and maybe why we should think of them as more central? And I think that that's a through line throughout my work of recognizing that we need to pay more attention to places that may seem on the margins. Mm -hmm. And so both my work in Cuba and my work in Southeast Asia I think, ask the questions about empire, about race, but also about that the states often use peripheral spaces in ways that are quite um, important strategically and politically, but that may be invisible to most people. Hmm. So that's what I study. Okay. And how many languages do you currently speak? Oh, not enough. So as an American, I'm woefully monolingual. Um, I have studied many languages. So I studied French in high school. My husband speaks French. My French is embarrassing. Um, but I did study French at one point. I have, I would say, good, strong, intermediate Spanish. Um, but I would not say that I've advanced to a truly professional level. I would say I have solid intermediate Spanish. Uh, I have very beginner French Creole, which is what they speak in St. Lucia. I have very beginner Vietnamese. And when I was in Austria last year, I took German and I very proudly passed my Ad Spy certificate, which means that I have a formally passed my A2 language exam in German, uh, which means I could start taking Be Eins classes, but I have not done so yet. But maybe I will be motivated. And how are you able to speak them or learn them? Oh, I mean, I've taken a range of language classes over my um, life, and I said all of them, uh, I'm a bit of a dilettante, none of them I've gotten to be particularly strong in. Um, for Spanish, I took night classes when I was working reproductive rights in New York City, and then I went to Mexico for a summer. Um, French was very formally in high school, and in German, I took some classes at Tulane, and then I took German classes when I was in Austria last year. So how would you say the field of history changed over time, like in terms of methodology and just certain topics? That is a very good question. Um, I will answer the question as it relates to diplomatic history, um, because that's what Gunter and I both study. Um, I think that the field has changed quite dramatically, and Gunter might say this as well. I would say 
up until about 2000, so in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, most of diplomatic history was focused far more on presidents, secretaries of state, uh, military leaders, looking much more at a top-down sort of sense of history. And, and that's arguably very important. Like, what did Richard Nixon do in 1970 in Vietnam? Or how do we understand the Truman Doctrine? Um, so I would say that for diplomatic history, that was the dominant set of questions through the 80s and the 90s. Around 2000, and maybe even the 90s, I'd go back even a little bit, things shifted. And there started to be a more greater focus on culture. There should be a greater focus on how foreign relations affects people who are not leaders, who may not be diplomatic um, leaders, state, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, etc., and more um, focused on quote everyday people and or um, a broader range of political actors. Another thing that changed, I would say, is that the field used to look, I would argue, more at great powers. Um, and it's interesting how one might define that. Um, today, I would say the field has changed to look at a much broader range of state and non-state actors. So, for example, my work, um, I actually care very much about state actors. I look at secretaries of state. I'm interested in larger political policies in the Cold War. Um, but I also was looking at Malaysia, you know, a country that's not usually grouped among the so-called great powers, right? Cuba would, you know, Cuba in some ways is in a place on its own because it is, um, because of its proximity to the United States, has been able to um, sort of define its world importance in a way that the United States recognizes, in a way that many other countries are not as sort of clearly on the U.S. radar. But I think that that has changed as well. I think that there's a greater focus on the autonomy and political goals of countries that the United States did not necessarily classify as, quote, great powers. So do you use oral histories in your research? And if so, like, how effective would you say that they, they are? Interesting. Yes, sometimes. So I've done interviews for many of my projects. I find them very effective. I mean, it's exciting to talk to someone. You get information that's not in the written record. Sometimes people contradict the written record. I've had, uh, I've been able to bring documents to people and they don't remember things and I show them the documents and they're like, oh right, that did happen. I mean, so you're able to understand like what people thought were important and what they didn't think was so important. Um, so I found it to be very um, valuable to talk to people. I also do very contemporary history. Um, on the other hand, I also, for example, for my last project, it was on Vietnamese Americans and refugee camps, and I made a conscious decision to not do a significant oral history project in relationship to that book because I don't speak Vietnamese well enough. Um, and there are several extremely good Vietnamese American oral history collections that are available. There's one at UC Irvine. Um, there's several other centers that have very good Vietnamese American oral history collections. Uh, I know even the HNOC is doing one here in New Orleans, and I just decided not to duplicate that work and also that my language skills um, were not strong enough. You know, I wasn't the right person. I don't speak Vietnamese. So I've done, I mean, I've made different choices and depending on the project. So in 2013, you organized the Guantanamo Public Memory Project. Mm -hmm. How did this project come about and what kind of response did you get from both the public and historians on it? Oh, I love this project. Um, so this is a project, um, it was started, I would argue, by a woman named Liz Sevchenko. She was working with a consortium of museums called the Sites of Conscience, and it was about museums that were trying to bring together the work of memory and, and memorialization along with human rights. And so they had this consortium of human rights museums around the world. And they had a conference in 2009, so this would have been seven years after 9-11, seven and a half years, and it was to talk about what it would be like to do a, to memorialize Guantanamo as a site of human rights abuses. And I went to that conference, and I remember, because my daughter was seven weeks old, which always has to get into the story, because I didn't, 
I, I almost didn't go because I had the seven week old baby who was nursing and um, and I wanted to go to this conference because it was I just read a book about Guantanamo mm -hmm. and so I left my crying child at home and I don't know if she'll ever forgive me but she will and um, and I went to this conference and I met Liz along with other colleagues and it included historians of the naval base in Guantanamo Bay that was my group people who are focused on museums around the world. So there's someone there from the Gulag Museum in Russia. There was someone there from museums in South Africa that memorialized um, apartheid. There are people from South America who did, um, you know, curated museums on human rights abuses in Argentina and in Chile. And then the third group of people were activists and lawyers who were representing detainees in the naval base in Guantanamo Bay. So it was a fascinating group. And out of that came this idea to create this project, the Guantanamo Public Memory Project. I actually was not involved with it. I was a junior professor. I needed to get my book done. I was like, it's too much work. Um, so a whole lot of other people were responsible for designing the exhibit, doing the research, making it a real live exhibit. Um, and then I went and saw it, and I just was like, oh, I still need to be in on this. And so I decided to bring it to Tulane. So I brought it to Tulane in 2014, I believe. We had it for about two months on campus, and it was at Ashe, the Ashe Cultural Center for a month. And it was just great. I mean, it was really one of the more exciting projects that I worked on. Um, it was a project that brought in a lot of community members. We did a lot of outreach in the community to get people on campus, and we did a lot of work to make um, events that would ask questions that the naval base in Guantanamo Bay raises, such as you know human rights abuses as it relates to incarceration, immigration detention, um, that are resonant here in New Orleans. And so a lot of the panels included both national speakers and local speakers so that they would be, um, hopefully would be valuable and interesting to multiple audiences. So it was a really great project. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Did the project um, from community members receive any negative feedback or? That's an interesting question. Um, not that I would know of. No one really complained to me directly, but I do remember, um, and I, I think I'm, I'm comfortable sharing this. It was actually really an important moment is that we were meeting with a few community members and there was a woman there who was, um, was, was a Muslim woman, and we were sort of thinking about who we were sort of going to invite. And we had like a whole list of like, you know, lawyers and journalists. And then she was like, we don't, have, you don't have anyone who like self identifies as like a Muslim American on the panel. Like, we can't have, you know, a two month long set of, you know, events. Um, because all of the individuals who are detained there are Muslims, and this has led to such a um, rise of Islamophobia in the United States and prejudice against um, Muslim Americans. And she really, um, I think, brought an important voice to our programming committee. And, you know, we might have, you know, done the right thing even if she hadn't been there, but we might not have. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did not personally hear any critiques either community or university, but there were definitely conversations within our group, and there very well might have been critiques outside of the group as well. Um, but for better or for worse, they didn't come to me. So can you just tell us a little bit about your book in camps? Like how long did you work on it, and how did you find the research topic, and what was your process of writing the book? Sure. Um, so this book, I guess, has two sort of origin stories. Um, the first is, so you both you know, are students here at UNO, for professors to get promoted, they have to write more things. And so I had to write more things. And so I had written my book on Guantanamo, and now I have to write more things. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. Again, I had, this, I had these new kids, and they were little. And so I found this um, idea or question I thought was interesting, which was that there was a military base in Arkansas, in Fort Chaffee, and there was a, it was used for a Vietnamese refugee camp in 1975, and then it was used for a Cuban refugee camp in 1980. And I was like, hmm, this is interesting. I'm interested in Vietnam and Vietnamese refugees. I've just done this book on Cuba. I've written about military bases. It's not far from Louisiana. This seems like this could be a really good thing for me to study. So I went to Arkansas for the week, 
and I did research in, uh, in Arkansas. I was at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And, and a former colleague was there at the time, Steve Striffler, who's also a UNO colleague, who was a really good friend of mine, who I actually met in Arkansas. And um, I was doing research there. And I found these pictures, which I found really shocking. And they were pictures of um, 1975, the North Vietnamese defeat South Vietnam. It's the fall of Saigon, in quotes, or not in quotes, whatever. But it's the end. You know, South Vietnam is defeated by the North Vietnamese, and the North Vietnamese declare victory. And this leads to the refugees um, leaving the country in 1975. And I never thought about how does someone get from, you know, Saigon to the United States. And there are all these documents that before they got to Fort Chaffee, which is where I was studying, they went to a military base in Guam. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And that's also part of U.S. imperialism. I also studied Cuba. Cuba and Guam both become part of the U.S. empire after the Spanish-American War. And then when they were in Guam, about 2,000 Vietnamese men, mostly men, there's a few women, but they're a small number, begin to say they didn't want to go to the United States. They wanted to go back to Vietnam. They'd made a mistake, or their wives hadn't gotten out, or something had happened, or they left someone behind. And so they begin protesting. And I found these images of Vietnamese men on a hunger strike on a U.S. military base in Guam in 1975. I just was like, what is going on here? I thought the story was that Vietnamese wanted to come to the United States. Who are these people who want to go back to Vietnam? And they shave their heads, they go on hunger strike, and I was just really curious what's going on here. So that's what started my book on in camps. And that really led me to look at refugee camps and what happened to Vietnamese before they got to the United States. So I wrote about Fort Chaffee. I have an article about Fort Chaffee. Uh, it's interesting that in the end did not become my next book. And instead I became much more interested in this place between um, and Vietnamese who both choose to who get to the United States and Vietnamese who did not come to the United States, some of whom chose to go back to Vietnam and later some were forcibly sent back to Vietnam in the 1990s. Um, that project took, oh goodness, about seven or eight years in total to work on. And I conducted research in the UK, Hong Kong, the Philippines, California, Malaysia, Singapore, and Switzerland. In Washington DC. So it took a long time. So do you think the United States is doing well with tackling the issues facing the refugees crisis both Today? globally, yes, in, in America? No. Um, so the short answer <laughs> is no. Um, so the U.S. up until, I would argue, there's people could argue slightly differently, but there's really not a major law that covers refugees until 1980. And that creates a law, it's meant to actually solve the problem of the Vietnamese refugees. The, the idea before 1980, there's a political crisis, and then the president could let in people as refugees under this parole exception. And in Congress, people didn't like this because the president having too much executive authority, um, it was also very much tied to Cold War politics, and this is where Gunter and I, our interests um, align. But for example, Hungarians during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 get this status, Cubans and then Vietnamese. And the Refugee Act of 1980 is supposed to um, make it more ideologically neutral, and it wasn't supposed to only be about the Cold War, and it was supposed to create a, um, a regular program so the U.S. would accept more refugees. And it also created an asylum process so that people already in the United States could then claim asylum. Um, that law really has not been changed or updated since 1980. Um, the United States, up until the Obama years, usually took in between 70,000 to like 120,000 refugees per year. I don't remember, and again, please, you can look this up. I, for the podcast, that's my wrong, but I think under the Biden administration, it was like still in the low 20,000s. I mean, it was still, I mean, it was slightly higher than the Trump administration where, you know, it dropped suddenly, but the numbers were nowhere near what they had been in the 80s or 90s or even under Obama. So the U.S. is resettling far fewer people than the writers of the law anticipated. In addition, what happened is that 
Um, what has changed over time is that the U.S. has taken in fewer refugees from outside the United States, but more and more people, and this is where the border quote-unquote crisis comes in, more and more people enter the United States and claim asylum. Um, this is their rights under U.S. law. The U.S. right now um, is very much in a policy and program of detaining people and deporting people, um, which is not really the intent or ethos of the refugee law. On the other hand, the refugee law, I think, did not, in fact, anticipate that there would be some people claiming asylum um, and using the law in this way. And so the law really is behind the political reality. And then the re so then the, co the consequence has been is that the United States has an extremely cruel policy um, where thousands of people are in jails who don't need to be and very, very few people get asylum, and there's a great deal of arbitrariness um, about the asylum claim process. And the large, I mean, I'm not going to quote numbers because they uh, will be wrong, but um, there's uh, far more people are denied um, than I think is warranted, and it has become, rather than a way to admit refugees, a way to exclude individuals. So I am pessimistic about the current refugee policy. So the work you do must be challenging at times. So can you just talk about a little bit about how you navigate some of the difficult narratives and topics? I mean, all, all pieces. I mean, it's the point of history is to ask hard questions, right? Um, I think my goal, if you're asking like the content, like the heaviness piece of it, um, in some ways, it's, that's where some of the conversations are helpful, just connecting with individuals and recognizing this really affects real people. Some of times it's about trying to piece together difficult stories. It's about remembering that there are political consequences. Um, I don't think that historians are neutral, and that's not really my goal. On the other hand, um, I also have come to learn that stories are always more complicated than I initially anticipated. And so to allow for those complexity. And so an example that I'll just give you is um, I do all this work on Vietnamese American history. And I've really had to change the way I both think and teach about the Vietnam War to some extent. And this isn't actually the emotional part. So in some ways, this isn't dealing with the trauma of war or the trauma of violence or people losing individuals. Um, but this is in some ways a little bit about how I've changed as a historian. I'm still very critical of the U.S., actions in the Vietnam War, um, I, I I still think that, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, I, and when I teach it, I'm like, why is the U.S. in Vietnam? Like, I mean, this is the standard, in some ways, many ways, standard stories about, you know, the mistakes going into the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Um, but now, because I've done so much work with Vietnamese Americans, um, many Vietnamese Americans, the majority, I would even suggest, um, support South Vietnam. And in fact, we're very critical of North Vietnam and we're the U.S. allies. And so as I've done this work, I've had to be much more thoughtful about what are the stories of South Vietnam, um, how do we have to think about South Vietnamese history um, alongside histories of North Vietnam, and also, you know, the NLF, which is the National Liberation Front that was fighting against South Vietnam and the United States. And so I've had to really um, expand my set of actors, um, even though I would still say I remain very critical of U.S. actions. Um, I would say that I see more complexity than I would have, say, 15 years ago before I started the research. So you mentioned before, but in 2022, you were awarded a Fulbright mm -hmm. diplomatic grant as a visiting professor at Vienna School of International Studies. So can you tell us how this came about and what experiences you gained from this? Sure. So now I get to sing Gunter's praises again. <laughs> um, so I, um, so faculty members also get sabbaticals, and this again is one of the real gifts of um, being a faculty member with the time to really think about new projects and expand our intellectual horizons. And I knew I wanted to go to another country for this experience. And I, you know, I've known Gunter at this point for years. And um, and in addition, I'll say just personally, my husband wanted us to go to Europe. So um, 
And so even though my research had been in Asia, we decided that I was going to look at fellowships in Europe. And so I saw that there was one at the Diplomatic Academy, and so I spoke to Gunter about it. And Gunter, of course, had many connections at the Diplomatic Academy. He's given many lectures there. He knows a large range of these colleagues and has known them for decades. And so I decided that this was going to be the Fulbright that I applied for. Um, because when you apply for a Fulbright, you can only apply for one position per year. So you can't apply to multiple countries. So I applied to the Diplomatic Academy. Gunter was very kind and generous and supported my application. And it was really just a wonderful gift to be able to be in Austria for six months. This was also during the COVID pandemic. So um, we left in Jan December 2021. So this is only a month after Omicron was sort of on the rise. So the fact that we were able to get on an airplane and go someplace just felt like a miracle. Um, and I just learned so much. I mean, I had a wonderful experience at the Diplomatic Academy. It is a fairly small institution. It's um, largely, it's a graduate institution. So most of my students were MA students in international relations. There was an English language environment, but I, you know, the 95% of my students were not North American. I had one U.S. student, one Canadian student while I was there, but my other students were all either European um, or I had a young woman from, from West Africa and I had a, a young man I think from India. Um, but it was just fabulous. And for me as an American historian to be challenged by students who um, are not coming from a U.S. perspective, to have colleagues focusing on Central Europe and thinking about the politics of Cold War history, not from a U.S. perspective, but from a Central European perspective, um, was radically different. And then, um, this, this was not, this is really um, tragic, um, but with also the war in Ukraine began. And so that was something we did not anticipate, but being in Central Europe made that much more to the forefront about um, thinking about the role of the EU, what is the role of the EU, and diplomatic politics in Europe um, became far more potent than I would have anticipated. So intellectually, it was really rich. Um, and personally, I, I had a great time too. And, 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 and having the war there clearly is horrible, but I feel like I had to think about it in ways and got to hear speakers and talk to historians who are expert in Central European history that I would not have had the opportunity to learn from them if I had been in New Orleans. So did you notice any differences between the approach to historical research there versus the United States? So this is so simplistic, but it goes back to your first question. Everyone knew eight languages. I mean, everyone could do the research. I mean, everyone spoke English. Everyone spoke German. And then to do this research, they then spoke three or four other languages. So they would then speak, you know, I had a colleague, a, you know, a great colleague, and he's, he spoke English and German. He also spoke Swedish um, Estonian and Russian, and maybe something else, you know, because he was doing work on um, the Soviet Union and the Baltic states. And so he had five or six languages. I would meet students, or not students, colleagues who were, you know, doing research on European history, and they would speak Italian, Czech, Slovak, Russian, German, and English. And so for an American, it just made me feel like how parochial we are, um, and that the uh, my colleagues' ability to do, I think, much better research because of their language skills um, was very apparent to me. So I think that was more the thing that I was most struck by. And obviously they weren't as U.S. focused, which is, you know, a good thing for Americans to be <laughs> forced to confront. <laughs> so if you're comfortable with disclosing this information, what current projects are you working on? Sure. So I have about three or four projects I'm working on right now, none of which are done. So I have, um, I guess I'll talk about three projects I'm working on. So one project I'm working on with your colleagues here at UNO, my good colleague Molly Mitchell and Max Crockmill, and we're working on a project on black labor history in New Orleans, 
which is a public history project, which for me, in many ways, is inspired out of the Guantanamo Public Memory Project, although that's not its origins. Its origins are with the New Orleans Worker Center for Racial Justice um, and their organizers who started a history project in 2016. It was a group of workers called Stand With Dignity, and they started a to document the history of black labor organizing in the city. And that project has now evolved to a collaborative project between the Worker Center, UNO, and Tulane. And we are hoping to mount that exhibit um, this spring. Um, and I am a labor historian, although I don't have expertise in New Orleans history. It's, um, you know, both Professor Mitchell does, um, and Professor Crockmill has expertise in oral histories, and the Worker Center is our key partner. And so that's been a really exciting public history project um, that I think will come about in the next few months. Then I'm working on a project that comes out of my time in Austria, which is what I'll share as well, which is a project very much related to what I would say is the failure of um, the refugee programs today. Um, the U.S. has a category that is not refugee status and is not asylum status, but it's called temporary protective status. So for example, if you are this is, um, Haitian and you are in the United States, and the earthquake happened in Haiti. The U.S. says, we will give you temporary protective status, which is you're not a refugee because you will be able to go back to Haiti one day, and you're not a, an asylum seeker because you aren't being politically persecuted. But you can't go back to Haiti right now because there was this horrific earthquake. And so the status is called TPS. And it's this limbo status. And in fact, people are in it often for many years on end. And it is in some ways about the failures of the refugee system and our immigration policy more broadly to not, um, in my political opinion, enable people to then normalize their status after they've been in the United States for X number of years. There's a similar temporary protective status in Europe. The EU created a directive after the Yugoslavian wars and the Balkan wars in the 90s. And with the war in Ukraine, it has essentially said that Ukrainians have temporary protective status. And likewise, the question is, well, how long can they have temporary protective status? Um, how long can they live in an EU country with TPS? So they're actually really different. I'm not going to get in the weeds on this, but I met a colleague when I was in Austria. She's actually um, a Turkish citizen, but we, she was um, studying in Vienna. She had a fellowship there when um, I was there as well. We both study refugee issues. So we're co-authoring a piece about the origins of temporary protective status in the U.S. and in the EU and thinking about their differences. And then the third thing that I'm working on is actually quite different, but I'm working on a project on the history of sexual violence in the U.S. military. And this is a brand new project. It will go in a totally different direction. But I'm looking at how did the U.S. military um, handle and consider sexual violence after the draft ends at the end of the Vietnam War and you shift to an all-volunteer force. And so it's looking at questions. In some ways, you're asking about difficult topics. But one question that I've avoided looking at is sexual violence. And I study military bases. I study refugee camps. There's sexual violence in both of those spaces. Um, I've not taken it up, um, maybe because I've avoided harder questions. It's also, um, I would say, at the edges of the documents. It's, not, it's often not as centrally in the documents. And so this sort of line of questioning comes out of a desire to look at sexual violence um, more straightforwardly um, in the U.S. military um, from the 70s through the um, wars in the Middle East in the early 21st century. So those are, that's what I'm working on right now. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Well, we've got a few little bonus questions. Okay, all right. <laughs> little, um, Dr. Lemon. Um, from our conservative calculations, you have um, four degrees, speak three languages, have written, co-edited, or translated five books and more than 16 journal articles, chapters or essays, received 12 awards or fellowships, have been interviewed, published, consulted, and or cited in more than 12 media outlets, developed and supported numerous public humanities projects, and sat on several committees. So my question to you is where do you find the time and what drives you? So my advice and where I find the time is um, I'm not a perfectionist. 
Um, <laughs> not a perfectionist. And then, the, and then, and the other by the time that I was like, what drives me? But the other thing is, I have a notebook, and my kids will laugh at me. And my husband hates it. I refuse to use Google Calendar, and every week I write a list of what I need to do on a piece of paper. And I have a little notebook, and I write down every day what I need to do, and I am not giving up my system. My system is very effective, and, I am, and I'm sticking with my system, and I don't get everything done, but I get enough done, and it's not all perfect, but I, I get things done. Um, so that's what I'd say in terms of the, the organizational piece. Um, the motivating piece is um, I love doing research. And I love following stories and trying to find stories that we don't understand or that um, I think need greater attention. And so I really am motivated to um, what do we not know about the past, right? I mean, that's what I think when people think about history, and I'm going to quote my husband, they often think it's the question of like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And that's not what motivates me. We often know the, and then what happened next, right? But there's so many other stories that we don't know. And it's trying to find the stories that are either on the margins or that we haven't learned yet um, and bringing them to light that really excites me. And I, I really find whether it's talking to people or going to the archives um, or putting those things together to try to put something together that's new, um, just to be really um, rewarding, hopefully, and it really makes me want to keep looking for more information because the information is there. You know, it's just a matter of paying attention. Yeah, lovely. Um, you've been to so many places um, for work, mm -hmm. and I presume you've developed quite a close connection with them. Which country, what place do you dream of going back to? Well, because of this interview, I'll say Austria, right? Yeah. <laughs> right answer. Well, that's right. No, I mean, I guess so the short answer is I don't know. Um, I am going back to Austria for a conference, I hope, at the end of May. There's going to be a conference at the University of Graz I'm hoping to go to on um, about the naval base in Guantanamo Bay. And it's a really remarkable conference about camps and incarceration in the Americas. And I'm hoping to be there in May. Um, and then after that, I always like going to new places. Um, and so for me, part of it is about exploring and pushing um, and, you know, trying to think about what else I can learn in new places. Um, but I could go back to many of the places I've been to. What do you think of when you think of Austria? What do I think of when I think of Austria? Oh, that's a hard question. Um... So I would, uh, I'll, I will, um, I'm waiting a bit because I actually, I'll tell you what is in my, what comes to my head and my mind, and then I will frame that. So one of the things that, I was almost only in Vienna. So the, the caveat is I really did not spend much time outside of Vienna. So almost my entire experience in Austria was in Vienna. I did not go to Innsbruck. I did not spend much time outside of the city, right outside of Vienna. And in Vienna, what really struck me um, is and for better for worse, not particularly historical or analytical, um, but there was um, the ability to move around the city <laughs> and the public transportation really was valuable to me and to my family. And so that was really, um, really fabulous. And, it, and it, for me, it was also great because, again, I have young kids and they were able to be independent in a way that they never had before. And that was really valuable. And when you ask me what it comes to my mind, I guess I will share, which is that I, and I guess I will brag as well, although this might not be so academic, is that Aust Vienna had 14 Stadt Wanderwegs, which are 14 city walks that are like mapped out around the city. And you could take a shuttle, not shuttle, you take a tram, you take the subway or the tram or the bus, and they would, you know, start in various parts on the sort of perimeter of the city, and you could do an eight to nine mile hike, and then you would get out, and you'd be in this beautiful place, and I decided I was going to do all of them, so I did all 14 Stadt Wanderwegs, and I think I'm getting them right, there were 12 Stadt Wanderwegs, but then there was two that had like a 1A, you know, and a 1. So I did all of the Stadt van der Weggs, and that was my, um, that was what I felt was most wonderful in terms of just the pure sort of attraction of living in Vienna. From an intellectual point of view, um, I really found my colleagues at the Diplomatic Academy and the University of Vienna um, wonderfully generous, but also really challenged me to be less U.S.-centric. 
and um, and to think about, in fact, the importance of the Habsburg Empire, which, again, as an American, I um, had not been as fully aware of. So I, I learned a lot about sort of reorienting um, questions of centrality, like place, you know, and, and thinking about um, European politics in a, sort of a way that I had to think about it more. But I love the Stadt van der Vicks. And lastly, from me, what is your favorite Austrian food? Palachinkin. Those are, for those who don't know, um, pancakes. They are thin pancakes with apricot jam and whipped cream. And for me, that was the thing I liked the most. The ice cream is also delicious. An ice cafe, which is when you have vanilla ice cream and they put coffee on top of it. It's like, and you, and it was delicious. But for me, it was the palachankin. So would you like to add anything else about yourself or Dr. Bischoff? Um, just a, I, I mean, Gunter is such a generous colleague and friend. And I think one of the things that's most important about Gunter is the number of networks that he has created between um, Austria and New Orleans. Um, he has really developed such strong ties. And um, when I would, was in Vienna, everyone had been to New Orleans. I can't tell you the number of colleagues I met in Vienna who had spent time in New Orleans and both knew Gunter or had been fellows at Center Austria, um, had been part of exchange programs. And that Gunter, I think, has been a model of intellectual generosity and collegiality and helped really foster academic and intellectual connections that I just simply think would not have existed if he had not um, really invested so much of his time and professional sort of expertise into creating Center Austria. So um, I just really admire Gunter. I feel really grateful for him as a colleague. I'm so glad he took me out for lunch 15 years ago. Um, and, you know, I just, you know, thank you guys for doing this. And um, I look forward to many more lunches with Gunter. So, good. Yeah. Yeah. We just wanted to thank you again for coming to the University of New Orleans and helping us with our project. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for stopping. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll tune in to the next episode. More information can be found at Center Austria's website, www.centeraustria.org. Und auf der Homepage des Instituts für Zeitgeschichte der Universität Innsbruck, www.uibk.ac.at slash Zeitgeschichte. Mm -hmm.